There's a study showing one expected factor that strongly predicted reform's vote share. And it wasn't age, income or education. It was ill health. Research has analysed voting patterns alongside the prevalence of 20 long-term health conditions across England. Everything from COPD and diabetes to epilepsy and obesity. Their conclusion? Areas with a higher burden of chronic illness were significantly more likely to vote reform. Not individuals, but communities where health outcomes are consistently worse. Why might this be? Well, when people face long waits for GP appointments, limited local services and chronic underinvestment, frustration tends to accumulate. And politically, that frustration often seeks disruption. So if other parties hope to win these constituencies in future elections, the message is remarkably clear. Address the health crisis, improve local services, reduce waiting times and invest in areas where illness and deprivation converge. In short, any future elections won't simply be about left or right. In many places, it will be about people living with poor health, limited support and a desire for someone, anyone, to take their circumstances seriously. But this raises an important question. If areas with the worst health outcomes are turned into reform, are reform actually the party best place to improve those outcomes? The evidence suggests not. Their manifesto offered limited detail on strengthening primary care, virtually no long-term plan for social care, and no credible strategy for addressing chronic disease or health inequalities. In other words, the very issues driving frustration in these communities are going to be largely left untouched. So yes, poor health may help explain where reform gains support, but if the goal is genuinely better health, shorter waits, and stronger local services, the data indicates reform are not the party most capable of delivering that.